Hello everyone, welcome to Ishi TV. I'm Ekta Kapoor. Today I'm talking to children's book author Rupa Pai from Bangalore. She was once a computer engineer who now writes on difficult subjects such as the Gita, the Vedas and the Yoga Sutras for today's children. How difficult can that be? Let's find out. Here's a little background about Rupa. She's written 20 children's books so far, and many of them have been bestsellers, enjoyed as much by adults as by children. Among them is the award-winning Gita for Children, which was translated into several languages and is listed by Amazon India as one of 100 Indian books to read in a lifetime. Her TEDx talk, Decoding the Gita, India's Book of Answers, has received over 2 million views till date. So hi, Rupa. Welcome to Ishi TV. Hi, Ikta. It's been so long and I'm so happy to be back here. Yeah, it's been a long time. And I want to share that I'm a big fan of your work. And I know that these books are for children, but uh, I, I have a few of them. I treasure them in my library. And I tell everybody, you know, especially mothers of kids, you must read this. You must get your kids to read this. And my own daughters, I've told them, you know, read a few pages, keep it on your bedside yeah. table, read it, yeah. you know, a few pages. And, and my daughters are in their 20s, by the way. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's how that's how much conviction I have in your books. So uh, I think the first, um, the first question on my mind, and I think anybody's mind who... Uh, knows about you would ask how did you go from being a computer engineer to writing spiritual books for children okay so the answer to that is the computer engineering was the detour actually uh -huh. uh, i always wanted to be a children's writer so this sort of came along the way uh, and that was mostly because of parents who and my mom who had who said that she wanted her daughters to have professional degrees so that they would always be able to stand on their own feet and although that argument didn't wash with me at that time, I thought she was like, you know, coming against my wishes and stuff, uh, not letting me follow my passion. But, uh, you know, and for many years after that, also I kept saying four wasted years, four wasted years, I could have done literature and stuff like that. But the way my life has panned out now, I realized that it was just probably the universe guiding me because I mean, I look back on the years in engineering, what I learned then also helps me in a way to negotiate my journey now in the sense of just being able to amass large amounts of data and be able to work through them and you know extract some meaning from them i think that training of not being intimidated by large amounts of data that you knew nothing about that comes from engineering so i was happy i'm happy i went through that now uh but so then the moment that was the contract i had that was the deal i had with my mom you know once i finish my engineering you can have the degree and put it in your puja room or whatever but I am going to be a writer. Then you can't stop me. And then she was, she kept, she was as good as her word. She never told me after that why you didn't pursue engineering. So right. I began to write, but not books. I began to, I joined a magazine called Target, a children's magazine that was my favorite mm. magazine growing up. And that had already always been my heart's dearest wish that someday I will write for Target. That was the ultimate dream. So, <laughs> you know, and strangely enough, when I moved to Delhi, I moved cities without even having that job in hand because I was so focused that I had to get in there. And when I walked in, Target, which usually never had any attrition in terms of uh, their employees, for some reason, the day I walked in, a week earlier, somebody in editorial had quit to follow her husband, who was an army person, wherever he went. And so there was a space, there was a vacancy, there was a spot that was seemed to be tailor-made for me, and they took me in. And that's how the journey started of being a writer. The spiritual books thing started after I had done my Taranaut series, which is a mm. fantasy series. Those were the kinds of books that I thought I wanted to write for children. And I did. Okay. And I did mm. eight books. And I enjoyed mm. myself thoroughly. And uh, then I was at a loss. And I, in the sense, like I said, I'm so fictioned out eight books. Like, I don't know what else <laughs> to write now. And I went back to my engineering training, did a book on popular science called okay. uh, What If the Earth Stopped Spinning and 24 Other Mysteries of Science. And once again, I was, you know, now what? And then my editor, the same editor that I had first worked with at Target magazine, who I had been out of touch with for so many years. Uh, I mean, she got back in touch to make me write the Tara Not series, but she suggested to me that I have exactly the, I know exactly what she'd write about. And I said, what? And she said, you should write the Gita for children. And I was like, are you kidding me? I, I, I don't have any family. I don't have much familiarity <laughs> with the Gita at all. I didn't grow up in a household that revered the book, mm, you know, and 
I, so I was actually very intimidated, but I made it out, or my mind made it out to me that, you know, no, no, I'm, I'm like a school children's writer. I like cool, I write cool stuff. I write about science. I write about adventure, sci-fi fiction. I don't write about this kind of stuff. And children get it a lot anyway from their own families and stuff. But then she, for some reason of her own, persisted and said, you should at least give the text a try. You should read it once before you decide this one way or the other, that it's not meant for kids and it's about death and why would I talk to kids about death, you know, things like that. And then when I began to read the Bhagavad Gita through commentary, uh, because I didn't know Sanskrit, now I know a little bit, but uh, when I began to read it, I was so riveted, so charmed, so captivated by the Gita that I said, my God, why haven't I read this text before? And it's, it will be so useful for children to read while growing up. It will change the quality of their lives if they had these wisdoms to, you know, to depend on. Yeah. And that's how. And once the problem with Indian spirituality or philosophy, I still like to call it philosophy. The problem with these texts is that once you had introduction to one, it, it has a hold on your head. And I went away, I did other things. I wrote books on economics and life skills and history. But it, then I, the pull was too strong, so I came back and I wrote the Vedas and Upanishads for children. And then, of course, then I, again, I wrote many other things, but there's always in my mind that I will come back to this landscape. There was no going away. And mm. now my latest book is, of course, The Yoga Sutras for Children. The so Yoga Sutras that. for Children, yes. Yeah. Yes, I love it. <laughs> uh, I, you've written, like you said, you've written a variety of subjects from mm. science fiction, fantasy adventure, um, you know, medicine, pop science, medicine, medicine, yeah. yeah. Uh, but which was the hardest for you and which one came most easily? Yeah, I mm, most, e I think the first eight books, right, the Taranauts books, mm. those mm. were the most joyful, but also the most challenging uh, mm. in terms of, um, I had to create this parallel universe where these mm. children, you know, the, the Taranauts lived. And then I had to come up with four puzzles per book, which could be logic mm. puzzles or uh, word puzzles, number puzzles for the, for the readers to solve and for the Taranauts, Taranauts themselves to solve. And that was my first attempt at writing a book for children, mm. really. Mm. So the, yeah. the easiest, it's very surprising. It will be very surprising when I reveal it to you. But some of some, something that flowed most easily was the Gita for children. You think, how, how isn't that? And I was really seriously intimidated by it when I started. But when I started reading, and when an aunt of mine told me at the very beginning, who she had a great familiarity with the Gita, and she said, you know, you know that Krishna and Arjuna are best friends, right? And somehow that had never struck me. With all my reading of Amatsura Katha, and I knew, it, I knew the Mahabharata story very well. So I knew a lot about Indian mythology, but not enough about Indian scripture when I started writing. Uh, but somehow I had never sort of internalized that they were best friends. It always seemed to me that Krishna was this God, mentor kind of being, and Arjuna was always, you know, kneeling at his feet. Kind mm. of, some of that impression had stayed in my head. So the moment mm. she said that they were best friends, I said, oh, so the Bhagavad Gita is really just a conversation between two best friends. And I said, I can do that. And, and two best friends, one of whom trusts the other so implicitly that he's telling mm. him, like, you tell me what to do and I'll do it. If you can convince mm. me, I'll do it, otherwise I will not. And mm. that seemed like such a great basis for a text or a, or a, or a book, a friendship, mm. a bromance, if you will. You know? So I said, mm. uh, so, that, and so once that had sort of planted itself in my head, that this is basically a conversation between friends, mm. the text just flowed. It seemed so intuitive what he was saying and and so I, I was so full of admiration for how Krishna tackled Arjuna's dilemma, how the questions Arjuna asked. And of course, over all of that, the person who had composed this Veda Vyasa, I'm like, wow, how did he come up with this tale and how clever to embed it in such a mighty epic so that we're all riveted on the edge of our seats. And just when you know, the world is about to begin, I mean, this is like taking it down to the wire like any... Netflix series today you know, where <laughs> everything ends on a cliffhanger. You bring us to a cliffhanger, the war is about to begin and then you give us this dose of philosophy that we have to internalize, that we have to go through before we get to the other side and know what yeah. happens in the war. So, yeah. I don't know, it, it, I, I, I can't even remember those four or five months when I was writing the Gita. It was just, every day mm. I get a joy 
to oh yeah. what will I learn today? And when the children came home every evening, they would get such a dose from me, and they you know, do, do, do you know, do you know, this is what happened, you know, and then this happened, and they were like, you know, we are not actually that interested or invested in this. <laughs> you are, maybe we'll finish the book and then we'll read it. <laughs> yeah, did they read it? Did your kids read it? <laughs> yes, 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 but not immediately. They took their time coming to it. And they now also they tell me, but we got enough gyan from you, Deepa Gyan, while it was happening, so it's okay. <laughs> Actually, what when you're saying all these things about bromance and best friends, you know, I'm just thinking that your books are so easy to read because you you've simplified these very difficult philosophical concepts and you've put them in such easy colloquial language, you know, that we all use and even kids yeah. uh, use. And so, how did you manage to uh, find the right tone to, uh, to communicate with today's young people? And you know, you're using these lol and you're using all these kind of colloquialisms. So, yeah. how did you manage to find that? Actually, the oh, you're familiar the first, with it already with your kids, yeah, maybe you're familiar yeah, with my it. My children were young when I, yeah. when I wrote the Gita, that was eight years ago. That's true, but I, I mean, I think I, I even today they are much older, they're you know, they've left home, gone, whatever. But I, I am drawn to the conversation of young people, it has always uh, because they, they represent to me freshness, new ways of thinking. Uh, yeah. And I, I really love being among them, the kinds of questions they ask, the, their innate curiosity, you know, which mm. we adults seem to have, seem to lose as we grow up. We sort of decide that this is either this or this or this, and I'm in this camp or this camp. But when they are younger, they're just exploring. Is it this? Is it that? And, and that is so fresh and, and it makes me think, rethink my biases, my prejudices. So they keep shaking me out of my own prejudice. And... When I'm listening to them, of course, then I come to hear the kinds of language they use, the lingo they use. And uh, so that sort of becomes part of my world also. Um, but I, I, you know, with the Gita, that was my first attempt okay, to write. Um, I mean, it was the first attempt to bring such a revered text. Yeah. And, and like I keep telling children, you know, it's not like Rick Riordan who can write whatever he likes about the Greek gods in, Percy Jackson, in the Percy Jackson books. Because nobody's worshipping them anymore and nobody cares about them so much. They're just stories. Now they've been reduced to just stories and nothing else. But in India, these texts are living, breathing uh, yeah. texts, you know. And, and the people feel very, very fondly and close. They feel very close to them. They feel very close to the protagonist. They identify with the protagonist sometimes. It's, it's a very different way of uh, engagement in, in India with these texts. Uh, mm. And therefore, I had to be... A little mindful of that so it was it was a bit uh, scary because i had no authority no credibility why should i be writing the gita for children i'm not some sanskrit pandit or i haven't i'm not a monk i'm not nothing i have not studied it but i think what i brought to the whole enterprise was my familiarity with children and mm -hmm. i knew how to talk to children and what might uh, interest them However, I never wanted them to lose sight of the fact that they were what they were reading, what they were engaging with was a very ancient text. You know, so I've never had um, Arjuna call Krishna bro or dude or, you know. So I didn't want to reduce it to that much familiarity. Also. They had to be always conscious that this was a very special uh, text. So I think I, what I did was I used this technique of using two kinds of language. When I actually told the story of the Gita itself, like from the, that chapter, I used a more classical kind of English, uh, you know, which would always make children know that man, whoever is reading it realize that, oh, okay, so this is, they're using some old language, you know, without actually having to say any of it. It just goes into your mm. head that they used to talk like that in those days or whatever. They didn't used to, but a little more classical, formal way of speaking. Mm. And then I used, I put these little chapters in between every chapter mm. where I extracted some one lesson from the Gita and talk to the children about it, how they could apply that in their daily lives, using very contemporary language, because that was mm. my take. And mm. I could then talk to them as I like. So I think that mm. worked. Um, mm. but some of the text, which is from the chapters itself, and I'm actually relating the chapters, some of it may not be so immediately understandable by children. Some mm. people have to explain it to them. But these gray pages, I mean, I call them the gray pages because they're colored a different way in the book. But the gray yeah. pages, any child could read and immediately relate to. And I mm. thought if I could bring the Gita that much closer to the children. Mm. They only have to read that other part if it's if it's too much. If they have to wait for an adult to read it with them. But this part, if they can read and get the mm. real rust, the essence of its teachings, mm. they've mm. already helped a lot. 
and mm. the would lose that feeling of i mean of, of being something on a pedestal that they cannot engage with unless they are truly committed or anything anyone can engage with it it is yeah. anyone that speaks to you you just have to approach it you know so yeah. i wanted to give that my um, aim was never that it should be the ultimate definitive text on the gita not at all this is just an introduction it's just meant to intrigue you create the spark take away the fear so that the mm. next time you engage with it you go in with a very different mindset than you would long for some boring book i don't want to read it why is my mom not in that way you go into it saying hmm it, it seemed interesting i want to see what else it says so i think yeah no i think it's very helpful even for people who have read the gita i think because it puts it in a very modern context Yeah. and you've given so many examples and uh, you know compared it to even in the yoga sutras that uh, yeah. you know with your new book that has come out uh, you've brought in you know why we need to create spaces for differently able people yeah. um, you know why we should keep it in mind when we build yeah. our cities so you've kind of related uh, those ancient texts to a modern context so yeah. i think that yeah. is helpful even for adults and children um you. you know so to bring it into our daily life and not yeah. like you said see it as something on a pedestal that yeah. we can't uh, you know relate to or we can't relate yeah. to it or or it requires too much scholarship or we must yeah. spend years before we get it no some of it is yeah. blindingly obvious and accessible of course yeah. to get past the layers the wonderful thing with indian texts is that or with any classical text that have survived the test of time is that there are always layers and layers of meaning and each mm-hmm. on each reading you discover a different layer depending on your own age your state of mind your experiences you know so mm-hmm. but at least the first reading it's not you, if you make the first reading itself so difficult then why will people come to it you know, so yeah so so tell me do you practice these philosophies yourself and do you feel closer to god or you know i mean what has been your experience after all this reading yeah so as i said once you start getting into it it some of it seems so logical and so compassionate and so mind opening that you can't escape after that you are you are committed you want to go back and read so i i don't know if my faith in god has increased so much or if i do more ritual kind of pujas now that may not be so but just the the working when i worked on the gita at the end of it i was enhanced in so many ways on so many levels i can't even articulate in what ways but the quality of my life became better i definitely stopped being judgmental of people i began to stop being such a control freak you know i i the little bit of letting go happened like the i mean some of the beautiful things about don't worry about the outcome do your best it was such a relief i could feel the weight lift off my shoulders that you know you am forget about what's going to happen don't don't worry uh, the universe will take care of it uh, anyway you have no control over it why don't you just focus on doing the best job you can and that feel felt like a release and uh, mm. yeah sure great i'm just going to do the best job i can in every moment and then what happens we'll see but i don't have to keep worrying about what's going to happen even with my children as a mother you know what will happen what will that fear it just takes away your mind and you're basically crawling like some uh worm on the not to decry worms <laughs> but you are you're not at all realizing your full potential because you're so beset by fear of your own fears and i think the yoga sutras particularly they talk only about that about how to liberate yourself from your fears from your layers of conditioning from mm. all the veils that obscure your view of the world you know just rip mm. them off rip them off. and whether i get there or not in each moment as i read about it i'm full of hope that maybe someday i will get there and that itself makes me a happier person and mm. i think really every the only the biggest thing we owe the world is to be happy and content in ourselves because yeah. if we can be completely happy in us if we can feel complete in ourselves that will radiate out to the world and touch everybody in our orbit and uh, that's a great service all to be Yeah, and do you do yoga yourself? Yes, I have been I've been trying on and off for many years, many 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 years to do yoga and it has never I mean I do it for a for a brief while and then I stop. But when the pandemic hit in the very first lockdown, I think it was March 26th or something, a friend of mine said, uh my yoga teacher is starting an online class, do you want to join? And uh, at that time, you know, we were so confused not knowing what to do and I was like, yes, yes, something, you know, let me start something. And I joined that yoga class. and it's been 3 years and some now and i'm sticking with it i'm still yeah. there and so i'm very grateful to my yoga teacher and yeah once again that has 
enhanced uh, just that whole wow. discipline of get to the mat at 6 a.m whatever happens <laughs> and that itself is a yeah. game changer yeah and I totally resonate with that experience of the pandemic because I was doing yoga before the pandemic, but uh, when it happened and people were talking about how pranayam helps your lung capacity yeah. and everything. So I started doing pranayam every day and now it's been so many years, three years, I still do it every day. Yeah. And I, I'm also doing my yoga. So, I mean, I, I tell my family, like, I don't understand why more people don't do yoga. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, yeah. just, it just makes so much sense, not just for physical fitness, like, yeah, yeah. but for the mind. Mind. Mm-hmm. I think people look at it very much as a physical fitness activity. And I can't tell you the number of times I've heard that, but yoga, yoga is so boring. You know, I want to run or something. I want to swim. Uh, yoga, and uh, it's like just doing the same things over and over. And I, and I want to say, <laughs> yes, it's that looking at the same thing, doing the same over thing and over, over, and yeah. over and over and honing it a little much more each time, being more with yourself each time, you know, finding that quiet space in yourself. Yeah, so, yeah. but it has to be experienced, I think. It yeah. has to be experienced, yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, all this, we're talking about all this, the yoga that you have, you know, you you feel it has changed you uh, in certain ways. Uh, has it also uh, you know, changed uh, the atmosphere at home and, you know, your children, your family, uh, your, your own relationships with other people? Have you seen the repercussions there as well? It is the mom, if the mom is in a peaceful, content place, the house becomes calmer. You know, it's, it's it's very much what the mom is going through and what she's projecting is what brings the calm into the house. And uh, yeah, yeah, I can see it in the impact on my children and my husband mm. for sure. Like, you know, mm. it's, it's calm. Whatever happens, that that is one huge thing, Ekta, that's happened. This yeah. calm. There is mm. an acceptance. It's not a passive acceptance. Like, ah, I can't do anything about it, so I'm calm. No, no, no. It's, it's like we will see this through whatever mm. it is. That kind of strength, you know, I think uh, mm. it helps. Yeah, I mm. think so. Mm. You ask them, but I think. <laughs> Yeah, but okay, so coming to the topic of the landscape, the overall landscape of children's books, uh, do you think children are reading more books? I mean, we see kids on the phones and on the computers all the time. So do you think they're actually reading books now or what's happening? So I see uh, what I feel is that I actually agree with what Ruskin Bond told me once very long ago. He said that, uh, you know, this reading books is always a niche activity in any age, in any generation. He said, when I was a boy also, there were only few of us that used to read books. Mm. And the other boys would be out playing cricket or uh, or <laughs> out swimming or just loafing around the bazaar or something. There were very few of us that used to sit down and read. So it's always been a very niche activity. Um, and I think it continues to be so. However, I think the exposure to reading, the awareness that reading is important, all that has definitely increased now because... And because also parents have a lot more disposable income, they understand the importance of their children reading. When we were younger, parents didn't have so much money for books, first of all. Mm. And then they Mm. would prefer that you read kind of educational books or something that helped you with your academics. Yeah. Uh, But I think now parents do realize that, you know, books have other kinds of books also are important. What they, you know, because suddenly it's become about soft skills and these kinds Mm. of values and things are got by reading or, uh, but... I also feel that why children may not be reading books so much, they are definitely reading a lot more, whether it's off their phones or whatever, you know, they are reading, they're always reading something, unless they're only watching reels or something, and then of course they're not reading, but I think think actually more children are reading now than before, because Mm. schools are reading programs in place, there's a lot of encouragement for that kind of thing. Books are more easy. The other thing was when we were younger, I don't know if it was the same for you, but we had such few, we had access to only few authors. I, had, I never even heard of Dr. Seuss or Roald Dahl until I was well an adult, when I was grown up and an adult, because we didn't mm. have access to those books. Now children mm. have so much to choose from. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that could be a problem also because the, there is a thing called the tyranny of choice when you have so mm. much choice that you don't know what to pick and your mind yeah. is completely fragmented. That's also a problem. But mm. uh, no, I think I meet so many, every time I also begin to feel like this, that nobody's reading. And then I meet a bunch of young people who are so passionate. I go to a lit fest and they're like, oh, you know, have you read this? Have you read that? Have you, you must try this new author, auntie. And I'm like, okay, I think the world is okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
so and and do you think on the other hand publishers and writers you know i there was this part in your um in your books that you know you you encourage people to be better human beings uh, you know and you, you even talk about things like communal violence for instance yeah. uh, you know uh, and i noticed that okay you are of course writing about a subject that is uh, more spiritual based more values based um, but there are a lot of other books that are fiction or you know they, they just have stories about animal life for instance or anything but do you think uh, publishers and writers are doing uh, enough to encourage uh, children to develop their compassion their you know wisdom and not just knowledge uh, yeah. and to be better human beings in society in general i think so i think mm -hmm. so at least the publishers that i know and i interact with and whose books i read they're very mm -hmm. very conscious of this so it might be a piece of fiction but it will uphold the values that are important ones like compassion or kindness or you know acceptance of the other and they they do they do or or nowadays a lot more of the what is called in the genre called climate fiction a lot more about how mm. to care for the environment and how to make okay. how to make the environment also a character protagonist in the book so okay. and i think writers and artists in general are very geared towards that they are generally those kinds of people who want to who feel very deeply themselves about these things so it's it's good because then they have they pass it on to their readers as well it it it, it comes into their books in some way or the other mm. so, mm. yeah indian children okay. writing seeing such a great period there's so much coming out for children and when so much comes out of course there will be some which are not as great as some others but overall the indian children have so much more to pick from and they they can never say now a child of this generation can never say that there is no representation for me because mm. indian children writers are writing from the point of point of view of somebody who is disabled uh, physically or whatever they write from the point of view of someone who comes from broken family so all the urban realities and somebody who loses a dear grandfather or a parent or you know whatever so they write from they, they populate their books with all these kinds of themes mm. so i think children will find themselves in these books which is what is needed which we didn't have growing up we didn't have indian characters in the books we read yeah yeah that's true there's good hope for this next generation i i anyway find this next generation to be much more evolved than we were <laughs> and, yeah. and it's uh, hopefully yeah, now with they suffer from a surfeit of compassion for mm. everybody and everything and they feel sort of so helpless that it drives them crazy that they can't do enough you know yeah. which is also a problem which is why again these spiritual books are very useful that you can't control yeah. it you yeah uh, yeah so. that's right Well I'm glad you've given me lots of uh, good you know reason for cheer and to hope for the next generation and uh, hopefully writers like you are going to keep taking on that you know coming out with these books which is uh, going to create happiness and joy and peace in the minds of the young kids so thank thanks you. a lot for the work that you do Oh thank you very much I'm, it just gives me the greatest joy <laughs> my indulgence keep, keep following your joy it's bringing joy to others as well and uh, everybody do read uh, rupa pai's latest book the yoga sutras for children it's out on stands this month and i'm sure you'll enjoy reading it whether you're an adult or you're a kid so thanks a lot rupa we'll be in touch <laughs> okay yeah bye bye